Welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm passionate about helping you master your animal training skills using the most positive and least intrusive approach. Here at ATA, we understand that navigating the vast challenges you encounter in training requires a comprehensive base of knowledge and experience. It's common to face obstacles and rough patches on your journey that can leave you feeling totally overwhelmed and stressed. Therefore, since 2015, we have been on a mission to empower animal trainers worldwide. We've aided thousands in developing their skills, expanding their knowledge, boosting their confidence, and maximizing their positive impact on all the animal and human learners they work with. And we're excited to do the same for you. Simply visit www.com. ATA member.com, join our vibrant community and geek out with us. And of course, in the meantime, enjoy this free podcast episode as we explore new ways to help you supercharge your training skills, grow your knowledge, and build your confidence so that you can craft a life that positively impacts every learner you encounter. But we will start on today's episode where I'm thrilled to welcome back to the show again, Ava Bertelson for part two of our conversation on cooperative care. Ava is a globally recognized authority in the field of animal training. Her extensive knowledge and experience backed by her master's degree in behavior analysis makes her an invaluable resource for trainers seeking to advance their skills. She's made significant contributions to the Karen Pryor Clicker Expo and is the co-author of the acclaimed book, Agility Right from the Start. Ava's expertise extends far beyond agility training, encompassing the core principles of positive reinforcement applicable across various animal training disciplines. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Ava back to the show today, who's patiently waiting by in Sweden. Ava, gratitude to you for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. I'm not sure how many times we've done this now, but it's been a few and we are very grateful for it. Oh, thank you so much, Ryan. It's always such a pleasure to be back and to get to have these conversations with you. It's just so reinforcing every time. So I've been very much looking forward to this one. And the previous guest to this was your your friend, Francesca, who I had so much fun talking to as well. So very appreciative of everything you do, including finding me podcast guests and being a podcast guest. But let's dive into today's episode, Ava. I'm excited to record this one for several reasons. Firstly, as we've just talked about, any opportunity to connect with you is always greatly appreciated. Second, for those who haven't already listened to part one, I am thrilled to let our Australasian friends know that Ava will be joining us down under later this year. She will be conducting some workshops here in Wellington, New Zealand, hosted jointly by us here at the Animal Training Academy and the fantastic Sophie Bell at Positive Behaviours and sponsored by the fabulous Bex Tasker from Positively Together. If you are interested in attending the New Zealand event and want super early bird tickets, then you have about five days after the release date of this podcast to snatch them up before we remove the super early bird pricing, which ends at the end of March 2024. So you can head to www positivebehaviors.com to find out more and secure those super early bird tickets. That's P-A-W-S-I-T-I-V-E behaviors with behaviors spelled B-E-H-A-V-I-O-U-R-S. On this page, you can find all the information about the event, which will be in November this year. And for those in Australia, Ava will be joining the fantastic Lisa Wright, from the Canine Education Academy for a similar four-day workshop in early December. These will be hosted south of Sydney, New South Wales. And you can find out more information about this at www.canineeducation.academy. That's spelled C-A-N-I-N-E education.academy. Ava, so, so, so excited about this. Can't wait. Me too. And like, I'm having so much fun just in in the planning of these events 
together with such amazing group of people. This is, yeah, this will be something. And it is my first time to uh, Australia, New Zealand. So I'm super much looking forward to, uh, to, to to the trip and to meeting everyone. It's, it's always cool to meet new people, new trainers, new training communities, uh, new dogs. And and this is, is truly such a, um, will be a lot of new encounters. So very much looking forward to that. Plus the bonus, I get to spend time with you, Ryan. How about All that? Right. I know, and can't wait for Summer and Kaya to hang out with you. But you should have seen the uh, host. So rugby's our national sport. You should have seen the the host. Sorry, the the club manager of the rugby club. We're going to be hosting you at uh, here in Wellington, New Zealand. When I told him we we're bringing a dog trainer in from Sweden, I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> at my rugby club, <laughs> the fair reason I'm looking forward to recording this episode is that I love getting feedback from our listeners. So thank you to at Elisa Siegel 8153 who requested a part two on your last episode on our YouTube channel and requested some specific topics for us to cover today as well. So we're going to do our best within the hour to address as much as we can. There might have to be a part three. We'll see how we go along with a bunch of thoughts and topics that you, Ava, have sent me. So let's Get going. First, let, let's let's set the scene, Ava. Can you begin by explaining when thinking about our overarching goals of cooperative care training, how attitude, direction, and precision play critical roles in its success? Yeah. For me, figuring out and like understanding what to look for in my uh, in my husband or training in the cooperative care and in, in, in everything that has to do with with the medical training and the everyday day life training, I think that has been one of my major development areas in, in just expanding my understanding of what what might it look like, what might be what might be what might we be looking for, and it's so easy to get caught up in. I would like for my dog to accept, be okay with, enjoy this or that procedure, which is beautiful, but what might that that look like? So once I started to connect the dots really between my old competition training or trick training style where attitude, direction, precision has always been my compass, this is... um, This list of priorities is something that Emily, my Carpet Momentum colleague, and I put together a very long time ago. And what are we looking for in our agility dogs? Well, attitude first, and then that the dog has a sense of where it's going, and then precision always comes last. So then for the cooperative care training, what might this look like? What is the attitude as in the whole picture? What does that look like? And that this is the most important goal when we get started is how how can I look for the full picture? And it might be um, a loose body. It might be a bit of um, relaxed breathing. It might be low intensity or it might be high intensity, depending on how you set up your practice. And it's not that it's one goal, but to start to tune in my observation, our observations, on the whole picture first and start building those behaviors, establishing the conditions under the, which these the behaviors that we can put in the, under the umbrella term of whole picture or attitude, um, focus on those first. And then second, the aspect of direction. This is something I've also discussed a lot with amazing Swedish horse trainer Angelica Heselius. In, and we've been comparing her work with the horses and my work with the cooperative care and how, where is the body going? Are, does, the, does the learner have a way to, uh, is the, are they moving forward? Are they balancing back? Are they leaning in? Are they leaning out? Are they, do they have anywhere to go? Like, can they move away from us? Can they come back? So thinking of direction in a lot of sense, as my second focus area. And then all the precision things will come last. Like if I need the dog to keep still and keep the eye open for 
uh, me to administer an eye drop, for example. This keep still and keep the eye open. If I put that as my last priority to focus on once I have the full picture and once I have the direction aspects, I've found that that has helped me tremendously and tends to be really helpful um, in the scenarios where I have been, been teaching the past years. And then comes, of course, the question, like, what specifically, what might that look like? And then we'll have to look at individual scenarios for individual learners and individual teams, because under this umbrella list of priorities, uh, we, we can, the specifics can, can look in a lot of different ways, which is sort of the point. As, as you're explaining this, which I, I really like, I think it offers uh, repeatable uh, and, and clear framework for thinking about cooperative care. And I'm imagining that, and, and tell me what you think and what your experience has been over that a lot of uh, intuition or uh, feeling when getting started in this is to go backwards. So it's just, so maybe a lot of trainers are starting with precision and they're thinking about what that part needs to look like before doing those first two elements. Yeah, I agree. That is both my experience with my own way into um, corporate care training of having too much of a position focus and not really knowing what what to look for, and and also definitely see that when teaching. And Chirag Patel has been one of my huge inspirations. And this is so brilliant in, in seeing all the bits and pieces of the full picture and working on many pieces at once and really. Um, really building the fundaments in a broad and and more. We've been talking about this as a as a liquid approach in a way that just building building where you stand and seeing many behaviors and many conditions as one at once. And I think that fits very well into this as well. And it's definitely different from a more detailed focused, maybe linear. Um, linear focus that a lot of people will get a little bit stuck in so can i can i use a example of me and my dog phoebe to and then take your framework attitude direction okay. precision and and see if i understand yes that would be perfect so we have been working on clearing what i affectionately call eye gunk away from the bottom inside parts closest to the, the nose of Phoebe's eyes. And I think I poisoned the chin rest a little bit, unfortunately, because there was a little bit of pulling on here and it became a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, so, you, so do I picture this right, that you have been practicing this? She has been doing a chin rest and you have been gradually approximating uh, the eye the eye cleaning and, and reinforcing like the chin rest behavior during eye cleaning did i get that right yeah i'll, I'll say that the, the behavior was they're fine and then i had kids and my life got turned upside down and the eye cleaning yeah. became more rushed and more sporadic as of when it allowed and when it was needed uh, and so i think in that set of antecedents uh and conditions i wasn't the chin rest to the point that when whether it's the chin rest or the paraphernalia associated with cleaning the eye and then in the conditions associated with cleaning the eye were present, she was a little bit apprehensive to do it. Um, we, we've come to a solution, but thinking about attitude when when thinking about this situation, I'm, I'm, I don't think I quite understand that part. Can you help me understand with the example I've given how we would think about this concept of attitude? What did you see when you started seeing the first little shift where you say, uh, she started to be a little apprehensive. What 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 was the first thing that you saw? Uh, a, a less uh, so when we were thinking about direction, there was a, a less intense pushing onto my hand with the chin. It was more yeah. lightly touching and hovering. Yep. Yeah. So less less intense in uh, using less force in less in the chin rest. Yeah. 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 What else? What else do you see in her general demeanor? Uh, might be body language, might be how quickly she moves in. Do you, did you see anything else that that was different? Yes, uh, the the latency and and the speed of which yeah. she responded to the cue. 
Yeah. And then and then the other thing that comes to mind is uh, previously whilst demonstrating or doing the generous behavior, if I was doing anything with my other hand, moving tools or maybe getting a tissue, a wet wipe in this situation, she would maintain the generous hair. She was more likely to flinch and say, sure, lift her head up. Yeah. So if we take those behaviors and we turn them up, turn them upside down and we say we want a higher intensity, you want a little bit higher speed, you want no flinching, rather the opposite, like what might be the opposite of flinching, more solid behavior. And we take away the precision aspect of the chin rest. So if we look at what does the whole, what does this, the opposite of uh, of hesitating latency, um, less less force and all of that, turn that around and take it without the precision aspect of the chin rest. Can we just get what does the more intense, short latency, zero flinching, uh, Phoebe, like, can we get that? Can you get that easily if you just go, I'm not even doing a chin rest, and I'm definitely not doing anything that has to do with her eyes. Is it easy for you to get to that? Th- those that that um th- those behaviors yeah i would say it's hard for me for me not to get that <laughs> if, cool, I'm, cool. if i'm set up in a situation where she thinks training is going to happen yeah she'll be there waiting excellent then that's where we start so we take away the chin rest and we look at that all those behaviors just generally in the training in the training situation And we start with making sure we have those. And then every aspect we add in, whether it is that we add in a chin rest or whether we start with adding in an object or maybe we start with approaching her eye towards your hand and vice versa, whatever we add in, we just make sure that we maintain all those um, positive for us positive and for her positive aspects of the behavior the the quicker movement and the i guess she's a little bit more maybe more upright maybe her tail is up the the looseness in her movement there is no leaning back so really starting from that and would that be the attitude yeah that would be what i would put under under attitude interacting with the whole scenario for positive reinforcement with all the body language and postures and movements and um, shorter latencies and and um, more either more intense or more uh, soft and slow depending on what you're looking at maybe if you are in a cuddle situation in the sofa then maybe it's not intense maybe it's rather oh, I'm moving a bit slow and easy and going in for a belly rub that would that would also be uh, more the whole picture or the attitude um, aspect. And it's, I think also look for like, I think it's important both for our conversation and for our listeners that you can find your own label or find your own, what is this top priority thing that we're talking about? But it is like the the wider picture and more the the whole the whole picture of the whole animal with all the body parts and what how do we in general want them to to move take away the precision behaviors and see that we have the 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 movements and the relaxation and the behaving for positive reinforcement gotcha so that that's the attitude and then, then the direction would be moving towards me in this specific behavior moving toward the chin towards the hand and pushing into it i would say that the next step for me looking at direction then we can which we can we need to break away from our list of priorities a little bit and also talk about what aspect of this behavior are we working on right now because you can work on approximations toward you cleaning her eye in a bunch of different ways. It may or may not be within a chin rest. And even if it is within a chin rest, you may start far away from the chin rest. You, it might be her moving her head toward your eye in, or her head toward your hand in a variety of scenarios. 
her it might be her eye approaching um the the, the a cloth or something like that even at an earlier stage it might be just how is she moving around you when you sit down on the floor is she comfortable coming close is she keeping a distance is she equally comfortable with her her butt moving in towards you or is she keeping the face towards you and sort of keeping her rear end far away from you what about if you move your your arms is she backing away when a hand moves or is she staying relaxed even if a hand is moving maybe even if a hand is reaching over her like so that we again start pretty far away from the final goal of uh, touching close to her eye with her keeping her head still and rather look at a lot of different aspects of what might the scenario be, what might your body, your body be doing, what might your hands be doing, and how is she interacting in that space. And I think beginning there, I had a private consult um, lovely cocker spaniel up here um just the other day and really getting started with new people was one of the the things that really really wanted to work on and then even if we're talking about eye care or uh, looking in his ear and things like that starting with just is he comfortable moving around on the floor eating treats that are scattered will he move a little bit like take a little bit of a turn to go past me or will he brush up against me to take the closest path to the next street? Is he moving, uh, when he moves um, past me, does he then quickly sort of move his bum away from me so that he keeps facing me? Or is he comfortably moving like towards me or away from me or perpendicular to me? First, just me sitting with my arms still and then with me my hands higher up and with maybe me moving and maybe him stopping close to me and then going away again. So all of all of that, again, first outside of the procedure or further away from final procedure and then approximating the final procedure. And when we, if we are in a scenario where we're approximating the, the final procedure, then it would be leaning into the chin rest or leaning in towards your hand um how the body is moving when like is the body leaning in when your hand approaches but i often work without any stationary target first like even if i want to have a chin rest so that the head is solid when i clean the eye i my personal preference is often to begin approximate animal moving their face into my hand and their eye into my hand without the chin rest first because I find it beneficial that the animal is moving its body parts into me rather than me moving my body parts into them. And so all of the part about let's say to some scattering of food on the ground and you're observing the movement of your learner and particularly, for example, if you're working on their backside or even if you're not, what their backside's doing, are they taking the quickest path to the food, are they skirting around you? So that part falls into, in terms of the attention, sorry, not attention, attitude, direction, precision elements that we're talking about. That part falls into the yeah. direction part. Yeah. And then the precision part is... The precision part would be more uh, the moving their eye into my hand or keeping the eye open or it might be if we want to have a behavior like the chin rest that might that that will also go in more the last mm -hmm. part which i would label more more precision type behaviors you can definitely see how a lot of that stuff is skipped in a lot of people's training plans yeah another way to conceptualize this could be like for some people like for me this list of priorities of okay start with the whole picture then see which direction is the body moving and then that precision last for me that has been super super helpful for some people maybe just the idea that you can split a procedure into a lot of components 
And the more different components you can isolate and work on separately, the the more helpful it tends to be. So that for some that might be, I typically think in both those parts, and I often draw it as a like we did in a webinar, like as, as a sun of okay, here is we need to do eye care. What are all the different elements that go into this? Well, there the dog needs to be close to the person. Uh, it has to do with the head. It has to do with keep eyes open. It has to do with um, there might be some tactile involved, tactile from hands, tactiles from uh, a liquid. It might be visual stimuli, like there is a hand moving, there is an object. All those things, we don't have to do them all at once. We can do, oh, here is this object that is the the eye cleaning. What what would you use? Like a piece of cloth or something? What I've ended up doing is just using water. Um, yeah. And just to moisten that. And I've ended up shifting the whole behavior to the car cool. at the end of a walk and just putting cool. water on it. Putting water How on it. How do you apply the water? I, so I just I just put my finger in a tub of water and then I, and when she's in my resting her chin in my hand, I just like really gently, gently without pulling, put the water on the, the gunk. Um and then and then I drive home. And by the time I drive home, I've figured out that it's moistened up enough that if I do the chin rest again at home, I can just slide it out without any pulling. So that's been the, the solution. But I, I got rid of the other things I was using. Like I was because we've got two kids under four at our home. We've got packets of water wipes, wet wipes everywhere. So I was using those because they were handy and they were always moist. Um, but I just got rid of all of that because I was worried about any associations that yeah, those that items is had. Super clever of just starting it over. And I think also what you did here in terms of make it easier, like let it mo- let the moisture sit for a while so that it's really easy to clean it out. I think that's also such an important aspect of, okay, how can we do the most for the learner, the simplest version of this, the least aversive version of this. This is the same with nail clipping or nail nail trims. Just if the feet, if the nails are more moist and not super dry, it will be easier to cut them. And if it had been, if it, I mean, it could have been that your finger or even you looking closely at her, that could be something that could occasion a little bit of avoidance. And then practicing just your face being closer, maybe her moving around your face when your face is looking at her without it having to do anything with eye care. We could practice that separately. And we could practice a finger that is pointing, like a finger that it could point anywhere at her body in the beginning. You might start with pointing at her tail. So, so splitting it that way and then the the drop of water, maybe that is something when it comes close to the eye that becomes a bit startling. Well, maybe then start with water on a sponge on her shoulder and then from the finger to the shoulder and then maybe uh, from the finger to her nose. It might be together with eating some tasty treats that this, 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 you have something that is like moist and a little bit drippy at the same time. Like you, I would, I would imagine mixing some liver pate or something so that it's pretty moist. And then, oh, there's a little bit of a drop of that that ended up on your nose. Oh, I'll wipe it off and you'll eat it. So being creative in, in splitting when needed so that we don't have to practice your face coming close and your finger and it has to do with the eye and there is a drop of water. We don't have to do all those combined. We can do them all combined, but we can get started with them separately. And that, so like if we were, you know, laugh everyone because half the episode's over, we had 15 things that we're going to talk about today. Um, that's, that's like 15 more episodes you got to look forward to. If we were say pointing to different parts of her body which i love would in terms of this concept that we're talking about attitude direction precision would that fall under the direction component in so much as we're observing what her or his body does when we do this whenever you're practicing this 
you would have your focus when you are doing an exercise or when you're doing one repetition of you, your finger is now going to point toward her body. You will look first and foremost on the whole picture, on the attitude side. Do you see any drop in any of the components that you put under attitude? Does her tail go down? Does her eyes stop sparkle? Uh, or the vice versa. Do you see that when your finger starts pointing toward her, that she gets more loose in her body? You see a little bit of excitement. Maybe she's looking for a treat. Like, do you, do you see the, the whole dog get look more the way you want the whole dog to look or less? You want it to stay the same or look better. You don't want your finger pointing to occasion any drop in any of the behaviors that you put under attitude. And then second, as you start pointing your finger, keep an eye on which direction is her body moving. Do you see any lean away? Do you see lean towards? Is she, once you have pointed your finger once, is she taking a little bit of a detour around that space the next time? Just keep an eye on where, what direction is the body taking? And also, if she were to move away from this pointing finger, how does she do that? Would would avoiding the pointing finger be uh, just take a couple of steps forward and see if there's a treat on the floor? Or would it be tense up and sort of just become a little bit frozen? I would much rather have that she just goes, oh, that's the finger. I'm going to move over here and find some treats rather than getting a little bit stiff, for example, or losing the, the tail and sort of sinking to the floor a little bit. So that that's um that there is sort of the 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 attitude aspects and the direction aspects definitely sort of seg segue together a little bit. But for me it helps to first just get do I lose anything of the full picture or does my full picture increase? If I'm doing good training, the whole picture should get better in because this pointing finger that should be a cue for yay behaviors reinforcement are coming this is a good thing just like when you're doing your trick training and you give a cue for one of one one of your cute tricks and you see the ice starting to sparkle that's what we should get when when we're pointing that finger and that is more important than whether we reach the eye with a finger or not yeah i appreciate everything you've shared and I'm excited for the listeners of this show to be thinking about how it applies to their learners, which I imagine that you, the listener of the show, are doing. Thank you for uh, listening to us talk about my situation and, and my learner, and I'm excited for you to do that for your learners as well. As I said, we've got a huge list of things to talk about, so I'm imagining future episodes to keep talking about cooperative care with Ava in preparation for her trip over here to Australasia. We have so much we can talk about, Ryan, but it's like the cool thing is that cooperative care isn't this just tiny little thing that we do on the side. It can encompass so much. So I'm like anything that has to do with behavior and learning and training. And we could talk, how can we do agility training that has to do with cooperative care? We can take, how can we take aspects of the shoot hunt training and incorporate, incorporate train, cooperative care training? So it's no surprise that we just want to keep talking about the, the, the subject because it's, it's marvelously uh, expensive. And thinking about how to prioritize the, what we talk about for this specific episode, I'm curious if maybe we explore the specific requests that we had from one of our listeners for this yep. episode. How does that sound to you? Yes, excellent. So there, there's two things that they wanted to know. And, and the first thing is uh, thinking about we're going to be, I think, entering the precision part of training and talking about starting points for our sessions. So a couple of points in here. Actually, hold that for. Let's talk about specifically in the realm of starting points, teaching start buttons in cooperative care training um, and how they can help empower our learners during sessions. Ooh, interestingly, the starting point of the, my training would typically, rarely, would there be 
me building specific start button be- or start button behaviors for specific things in the very beginning of the training. Because I'm so focused on, okay, look at what we have, what I have in front of me. Um, how can we set up the environment so that we build comfortable, relaxed behaviors uh, moving all around? And then when the time when I see myself start using the start button concept is often when when I start introducing something like me moving, me reaching out a hand, uh, introducing an object, something like that. Because whenever, when I start moving or doing things, and that might not, usually that is not the very beginning of the training procedure. Usually that's not the very start of the training session. But as soon as or when I start doing things like moving, um, reaching arms out, introducing objects, then I will quite often do that in a few predictable repetitions where the my arm moving or me standing up or um, me reaching for an object is followed by um, reinforcement. Either just like a pairing, I just happen to put my hand out onto the table or onto this object that's on the ground and I toss a treat right after. Or I might put my hand on the floor or my hand on the object and the dog looks toward it and I toss a treat. And I do that repeatedly a couple of times and then I will look for, will the learner, now I said dog, but of course that can be any and any learner, will the learner initiate the next repetition? Will the learner start doing something for the consequence package of me putting my hand on the object and tossing a treat? And that might be just for a few repetitions. And then I will be going back to reinforcing a variety of behaviors and creating a variety of antecedents where it may or may not be super predictable what my next move is. Because I want my my learner to build these relaxed and engaged behaviors under a lot of different conditions. And with the start buttons, then it is predictable per definition. Then the dog is controlling, the learner is controlling what I do. So I will usually do that for short segments and then I will do something else and then I'll do that for short segment again. The the version of a start button behavior that I think a lot of people are are practicing for um, for cooperative care where you would use a duration behavior as a start and continue um, behavior. For example, dog does chin rest. I start moving my hand. If the dog takes their head up, I will stop moving my hand. If they put the head down, I will start moving my hand again. Reinforcement for head down while my hand is moving. That, That version is also something that I include in my training. But it's not a first, it's rarely a first step. And quite frankly, it's rarely the only thing I will do with my chin rest. I will often have a more wide variety of details that I will reinforce within the chin rest behavior. So not not always, and maybe even usually. Uh, how do I place this? Usually. In my own training, I do not have a one single, uh, this chin rest always means I start doing something with your eye and that is a clean start button behavior. Oftentimes, I would will be using a more flexible approach. But it will be, I will be using super clean start button behaviors or start button contingencies on specific occasions in my training, whenever I see it's it's useful or, or necessary, um, or useful or helpful. So I will be doing that a lot, but it's not a linear approach where I build my entire um, cooperative care, that I build my entire cooperative care behavior repertoire upon, if that makes sense. And I know that this is quite different from what a lot of people are 
doing, and I think you can you can work with this in a lot of different ways, but I would advise against focusing so much on this has to be a super clean start button contingency that that get if that gets priority over your best training choices, then you're missing out. Coming from me who loves my start button contingencies, I do, I use them all the time, but they should be for reasons, just not just because this is how we should do things. They're not a rule to live by, they're a helping aid. Right, and then your best training practices, which you which you, I don't know if you use those specific words. I'm trying to write down the word you're saying whilst listening to you at the same time. I'm not the best at it. But your best training practices, uh, is my understanding correct that when you say that, what you mean is that you are being attentive to and observing the behavior, sometimes large, sometimes minute, of the animal, of the learner in response to whatever's happening in this environment. So when you move your finger towards it, what is the attitude looking like? Do you see a drop in the tail or a decrease in the eye sparkle to stay with the behaviors that we've been talking about? Um, and do you see any movement away or towards that change in the animal's yeah. environment? And can I, based on those observations, both adjust what I do to increase, like as antecedents, to increase the likelihood that I get more of the behaviors that I'd like to see more of, all these different types of behaviors that you just described, and can I make sure to reinforce them? And this is where you might see reinforcing, the, it, this, this is where it might clash a little bit if you at the same time try to stick to super clear start button contingencies. Because in a super clear start button contingency, my chin rest will be followed by me doing something and then reinforcing that. If I reinforce a bunch of versions of this chin rest behavior without the chin rest being instantly followed every single time by my uh, by, by me doing something sort of to the animal, then it's not a clean start button contingency anymore. But it can still be brilliant training. It's just if I'm reinforcing the start, the if I'm reinforcing my chin rest behavior without the chin rest behavior starting me doing something, then it's the definition of the start button behavior. But it can be very helpful to do that, to establish this really relaxed chin rest behavior and to maintain this relaxed lean in um, chin rest behavior, just as one example. Yeah, and I think maybe the best way to learn about this because it's hard is to see a master in action such as Ava. And when I say master, I mean someone who has fluency I think the ability to make decisions in real time, Ava, uh, is something that takes time and experience. Would you agree? And so, the yeah. it's, it's 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 for the listener of this podcast and for anyone learning a new skill, whether it's in animal training and teaching start button contingencies or in, in any area of your life. There's that difference between doing what the textbook says. And having the experience and the learning history to be making quick decisions in real time as your learners behaving in front of you now. And that's why I am so excited for you in Australasia to come and watch Ava in action because she is one of the best, most talented uh, that I've met and one of the people that I'm most grateful for who has this level of fluency, what I called mastery before. Um, and so I think it's such a great opportunity for those in Australasia to, to learn about this because you, as a learner and as a listener of this podcast show, are learning what does the start button mean? How do I implement it? And you have that textbook meaning and definition and then you've got to get some practice with your hands-on practical uh, learner. Um, and I just am so excited about the opportunity for people to to see you in action here in Aotearoa, New Zealand uh, and, and Australia, Ava. Um, we got another question that's come from the, the our listener. I have a question for you, Ryan. Do yes. You, or shoot. I have a thought. Would you like a brief expansion on, okay, how can you simplify? What can you take away immediately from what we just discussed? Because I have a, 
floating in my thinking a bit of, okay, here, here are some simple, simple things that you can do from all of this. I think the listeners' brains would appreciate that. I think my brain would appreciate it too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really also, when we talk about, okay, what do we, like, uh, coming coming uh, coming to uh, to Australia and New Zealand and getting to work and practice like okay what is it what is it we teach what is it what we look for well first and foremost if we look for if we make sure to give the opportunity to opt out start there just give the opportunity to opt out make it easy for the learner to opt out listen to the small signals that might indicate no in any way and make it easy for the learner to opt out. And then you do the work of figuring out, as a trainer, you do the work of figuring out, oh, how can I make this so easy, so comfortable, um, split it in so small steps, make it so reinforcing, and reinforce the relaxed responses, the engaged responses, the uh, the sparkly eyes, and so on, make like the, these are behaviors too. We can we can build them. We can reinforce them. Uh, start there. Those two components. Just make it super easy to opt out and build what we have discussed as as attitude. Focus on that first. I think what I see when people find it super helpful to do target behaviors as sort of start button behaviors. I see a lot of it makes it very easy for the learner to opt out. And that means that it might not be like so important what we call it, just make it easy to opt out. Have have things to look for to make it easy for your learner to opt out. That pretty much covers a lot of what we've been talking about. And then second, just look at what you're seeing. Like, is your learner happy, relaxed, engaged? Do you have this whole attitude thing? Then you're doing things well. It can you don't have to follow a rule book. I don't know how many times I've had clients, students who are like, oh wow, that's so relieving. You mean I don't have to do it in a specific way? And I'm like, no, you don't. As long as you see that your your learner is happy and engaged, whatever that looks like, happy, relaxed, engaged, whatever, uh, and you can get to do things and you see progress over time that you get more and more of what we would label the attitude that we like, uh, the whole picture. As long as you're getting more and more of that and not less and less of it, you're doing good. It's it's not about the specifics and how you do things. It's about are you are you approaching the goals that you have set for yourself? And as long as those goals include the learner and indicators of the learner's uh, experience and behaviors that will be helpful for the for the future, then you're doing good. It doesn't have to look in a specific way. Opt out and happy learner, you're doing good. And what, why is it vital? Can you just, in your words, uh, and, and you the listener, might be sitting there going, I already, I already know the answer to this question that I'm going to ask, but I really want to hear it in Ava's words. Um, thinking about understanding reinforcement and, and accessing a negative reinforcement in the context of cooperative care training. Why why is it so vital to approach this so thoughtfully? If we put our learners in situations where there are aversives of an level present and they do not have a way to control them or move away from them, we will see we will likely see either that they start to develop other behaviors to access that negative reinforcement, other behaviors to escape or avoid. So if they used to lean back or step away as escape or avoid, and we didn't listen to that, we kept following, we kept or we were holding on to them, then what might they do instead? to escape or avoid. They might uh, go stiff, we might see growling, we might see showing teeth, we might even see biting, uh, or we might see becoming very, very passive, stop eating, sort of shrink to the ground. And then if if those behaviors start to develop, 
and we put our learner in a new scenario. For example, if this starts happening at home and now we're going to the vet's office where we have additional difficulties, this might mean that our learner doesn't get the best quality care because it's not possible for maybe it's not possible for the vet to approach them or maybe they will get an unnecessarily aversive experience because now they are so busy trying to avoid the whole situation. So they're not accessing any positive reinforcements. They're not eating, they're not cuddling, they're not exploring, they're not greeting the person because they're so busy sort of shrinking through the the floor trying to avoid the whole thing. So if we build from the get-go that it's easy to escape and avoid and that you can access positive reinforcement both for staying and for moving away, then we build a completely different repertoire that will be much more helpful um, when in more difficult situations. Moving away instead of biting someone is very helpful, both for the for the for the individual and for the person who's not getting bitten. And continue being relaxed and moving away rather than stop eating and shrink through the floor and just go inside yourself and avoid everything will be uh, will will also be much more helpful when you try to take your training on the road. If the learner has practiced a lot of, I cannot escape this, I will just be very still and make myself very small. I think a lot of people have had a lot of experience and how difficult it can be to move on with training when the learner is busy uh, just trying to avoid the whole situation. So if they have practiced, ah, there is a hand coming rather than I'm going to shrink through the floor and just disappear into myself. I just take two steps away and I'll find a treat over here and then I'll come back. Uh, it, it it makes life both more much more comfortable for the individual, but it also aids our training, especially then when we want to advance in our training or put ourselves into more uh, difficult situations. And also it helps build a foundation repertoire so that when something happens that is outside of that, when we need to use force restraint, for example, or when something really aversive happens, it will be much easier to build back the old behaviors if they have been established, if the more relaxed behaviors have already been established, if the control of the situation being able to move away, if the learner has a lot of experience with that already, then the occasional time when they don't have that control uh, might have less impact on their long-term behavior. Thank you for sharing that, and I think that ties in nicely to go and circle back to the start of the episode where the opposite of some of the things that we've been talking about now is behaviors relevant to your individual learner that we would be working towards in that attitude part of the attitude direction precision concept that we start this episode with. Start this episode ambitiously with a list of 15 things to talk about. We covered three of them. We did a fifth. I mean, kudos to me and you, Ava. I think we should give ourselves a pat on the back for that. Uh, we're we're nearly reaching an hour. So as, as we wrap up today's e- episode, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who tuned in and to Ava for joining us and sharing her invaluable insights. It's been an enriching episode and we hope that you, the listener, found it as enlightening and enjoyable as we did. Before we sign off, a quick reminder about the exciting workshops coming up. Ava will be gracing us with her presence here in Wellington, New Zealand, for a series of workshops hosted by us and Positive Behaviours with, again, the generous sponsorship of Positive to get Positively Together. These workshops are a golden opportunity for our Australasian community to deep dive into practical, force-free training techniques and strategies. For our New Zealand listeners, remember you have until the end of March 2024 to take advantage of the super early bird prices. Uh, Don't miss out on this chance to secure your spot at a discounted rate. Visit www.causativebehaviors.com for all the details and grab your tickets. That's P-A-W-S-I-T-I-V-E, behaviors, spelled B-E-H-A, 
V-I-O-U-R-S, where you'll find all the information you need about the November event. And let's not forget, of course, our Australian friends, Ava, will also be collaborating with the Canine Education Academy in New South Wales for a four-day workshop in early December. Uh, so that's another fantastic opportunity to enhance your training skills with Ava's expertise for our Australian listeners. For more information about those workshops and to register, head over to www.canineeducation.academy. Canine spelled C-A-N-I-N-E. And we will, of course, link to all of us in the show notes as well. Ava, this has been so much fun from myself and on behalf of everyone listening. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and hang out with us again today. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Ryan. And as you said, really looking forward to what people take away and how how they connect dots to what they're doing and thinking. And I'm just looking forward to connect everyone both virtually and on site. So thank you. And thank you so much for listening as well. This is your host, Ryan Cartledge, signing off from this episode of the Animal Training Academy podcast show. We hope today's conversation inspired you and equipped you with new tools for your trainers to box. Remember, every challenge in training is an opportunity to learn and sharpen your animal training geekery. Embrace the rough patches, learn from them and keep improving. And don't forget, the path to growing your skills and expanding your knowledge continues beyond this episode. Visit www.atamember.com to join our supportive membership, where you will find a community of trainers just like you. Together, we're making a huge positive difference in the lives of animal and human learners worldwide. Until next time, keep honing your skills, stay awesome, and remember, every interaction with an animal or human learner is your opportunity to create ripples. We are here cheering you on every step of the way. See you at the next episode.